Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, science and innovation with small space platforms. I'm going to tell you about very small satellites, a new wave of satellites which are coming. Um, I'm working uh, uh, in Aalto University uh, together with a growing amount of, of people working with uh, science and technology um, aspects of, of space, space research. Um, for an introduction, we're living in a, in a global world which is getting global and global all the time and all the global challenges needs a global view, a, a global tools to, to, um, to be used. Uh, unfortunately, only place to actually get this kind of very global view is, is from space, which is very expensive because it's very expensive to get to space. Uh, we're still using uh, rocket technology, which is 50 years old technology, basically even almost the same, uh, same rockets we are using. And uh, the cost per kilogram to be launched to the low Earth orbit is quite high. For example, if we take um, pride and beauty of, of uh, European Space, uh, Space Agency, um, Envisat, which was very big and heavy satellite, it was like 140 million uh, just, the, just the launch of the satellite. And this of course has a lot of implications because if you have something which cannot be repaired or serviced uh, during this lifetime, uh, you have to be absolutely sure that it actually works. And uh, it makes very, very expensive to develop and make these kind of instruments because you just cannot fail. fail. And that's, that's why uh, space technology is very expensive and it's, it's organized and, and works in a certain way. However, nowadays arise, arising a new uh, sort of type of spacecraft, very, very small spacecrafts called uh, nanosatellites which are extremely small, only a few kilograms, and launch of this kind of spacecraft is a fraction of the cost of the big spacecraft. And not only the launch is very much cheaper, it's also the building of these kind of spacecrafts are um, much, much cheaper. <coughs> For example, here is a, a comparison with a uh, Raytorsat 2, and uh, our ISAIC um, spin-off has calculated that ISAI satellites, you can build 500 ISAI satellites for the cost of, of one Raiders of two. So this is a game changer. It's like a, a car would cost 100 euros. Or if you find one in sale, it's like 30 euros. You just go and buy it and use it, and, and if, you, if you need it, you dispose it. So this kind of drastic change in launch markets has been uh, also uh, caused a boom of small satellites. And what I'm talking about here is uh, this kind of launches. For example, uh, this is the Dnepr launch from last year, last autumn, which delivered 24 small satellites at the same time to low Earth orbit. There is another uh, example. Um, International Space Station delivers like quite regularly nowadays these kind of small CubeSats to orbit, to low Earth orbits, a bit lower than uh, you know, ISS itself. A big player behind this uh, success has been this standard, CubeSat standard. Uh, and uh, the funny part of this CubeSat standard is that this is actually most of the standard you see here. This is all, all the standard you need. So having this piece of paper, you can start to build the spacecraft. No, not really, uh, but, but almost. It's really simple standard. And it, it includes also uh, not only standard for the size and shape of the satellite, but also the deployment uh, port, deployment unit, which is standardized throughout the, the different uh, rockets. So you can actually hitchhike a ride to any kind of, of rocket launch whenever you need. And um, lead times are really short, like one year, maybe two years, sometimes even half a year, and you can book your flight and go to space. Uh, this is uh, a picture from uh, one of our bachelor thesis from this uh, spring. Um, uh, Juha Suakas was uh, investigating how many CubeSats there are flying at the moment, how many has been launched, and this is how it is growing. This is last year. Last year, over 80 CubeSats, only these CubeSat standard CubeSats, very small satellites, were launched, and this was actually more than all the 10 years before it, together. And it seems like this trend is continuing. 
Also, what you see here is, is uh, research satellites increasing, but also there is a tremendous increase of commercial satellites. So already this year, a very significant amount of, of totally commercial satellites are put uh, <laughs> into the orbit by this standard. If we take a worldwide view how these CubeSats are, are developed, uh, CubeSats were born in the United States, and the United States is, is a leading space country with a, a huge capacity for, for launching satellites. Mm -hmm. And not surprised that most of the CubeSats are coming from the United States. Another leading country is Japan, uh, who is also launching a, bit, uh, a, a lot of CubeSats. And Europe, Europe is, is slowly, slowly uh, coming to catch also the world development in this respect. This CubeSat standard has been also uh, caused some uh, changes in the, in the scene which we are seeing in, the, in space technology. New countries like Romania, Hungary, Poland, Estonia, Ecuador, Peru, all these countries are nowadays space countries. They operate their own spacecrafts and they all started with the first satellite which was CubeSat. So this is a picture taken from Estonian uh, first uh, satellite S-Cube, which uh, carries a Finnish payload, uh, which was already introduced by Pekka uh, a few presentations ago. And here is a, a proud team of Estonian space engineers, a first generation of, of Estonian uh, space engineers with their CubeSat, which is really a small unit. And it's in space, uh, delivering beautiful images, working properly, hopefully doing also some significant science uh, with um, plasma break system. So this huge, uh, huge uh, CubeSat boom has been driving uh, some quite interesting <coughs> innovations. For example, there, is, uh, there are groups who are putting and building um, spacecrafts around mobile phone. Because mobile phone has all the parts and pieces which you need. It has cameras, it has radios, it has gyros, magnetometers, digital uh, signal processing units, Whatever you need, everything is there inside, and it costs a couple of hours, uh, hundreds of euros. There is uh, approaches to make a huge fleet of CubeSats, which are actually uh, making sort of internet of space, uh, links between uh, satellites, uh, collaboration between satellites, program-based radios, using the same radios for GPS, for ground communication, for inter-satellite communication. Uh, of course, a big problem with this kind of satellites, if we launch so many satellites to certain orbits, it's going to be crowded, and space debris is, is, is going to be a problem. This is a Polish idea how to reduce space debris. Another idea was, uh, was here presented already, the plasma break idea, but this is a very simple mechanical system which could be deployed and which should also <laughs> reduce the lifetime of the satellite. Uh, systems which are uh, made by different small satellites coming together, forming a bigger, a bigger groups. And here is a, a first really significant CubeSat um, spin-off company, uh, Planet Labs, which launched 28 uh, very small CubeSat satellites, each of, of every one carrying an optical camera, which is capable to measure with a ground resolution of four and a half meter. <coughs> They are planning to put these satellites, more than 100 satellites, to low Earth orbit and start to sell the data, start to sell the images. And this is totally uh, commercial-based activity already. And it's not only uh, restricted to uh, Earth orbit. There is a conference already, Interplanetary CubeSat Conference, every year or every second year. And there is uh, serious ideas to, to develop CubeSat concept so far that you actually can go further than just uh, Earth orbit. What about the science? So it's so small, one liter of, of the satellite, what can you do with it? Appears that there is a lot of things you cannot do, but there is also a lot of things you can do. And the amount of uh, scientific instrumentation is increasing very rapidly. There are already magnetometers, mass spectrometers, <coughs> Langmuir probes, high resolution cameras, low resolution cameras, spectrometers, and so on and so forth. 
So there is a, a study uh, made recently which is listing all different technologies which are available <coughs> for CubeSats. And many of these uh, instruments might be available even on commercial basis. So you just go to the web shop and order your satellite part and after a couple of months it's, it's uh, behind your door. So now let's come back uh, to Finland from this background uh, mm -hmm. review. And uh, in Finland, small satellites have been also quite popular. Already in 93, there was uh, several actually plans to uh, build a Finnish satellite. Uh, Hotsat was one of them. Uh, there was Fimsat, uh, also made in um, um, Helsinki University of Technology. There was also FS1. Uh, Duja was involved in this project, as I know. And there was beautiful spacecraft designs. Unfortunately, none of these uh, spacecrafts uh, were really uh, built so far that they could be launched. And um, let's come to the present day. Here we have another try. In Aalto University, uh, 2010, we started again with uh, small satellite projects. And at the moment, in Aalto University, there is running three uh, small satellite projects. ALDA 1 mission, ALDA 2 mission, and ISI uh, project, or ISI mission, which is actually a spin-off mission from, from ALDA 1 uh, satellite. ALDA 1 satellite project is a CubeSat project, um, and it's a huge effort, a huge um, cooperation effort, uh, bringing together very different institutes and companies from Finland to build a, a quite small, uh, a simple CubeSat. Uh, and if this uh, if this project is, is successful, um, might be easily the first uh, satellite of Finland. At the moment, we are already negotiating uh, for the launch for next year. Uh, there is also the 2 satellite, which uh, belongs to uh, QB50 consortium. It's a project um, uh, funded by European Union. Uh, it's um, led by uh, Von Garman Institute from Belgium. And uh, the idea is to put uh, 50 small 2-liter satellites uh, to very low orbit, below 400 kilometers, and to scan with a 50 um, satellite uh, pearl configuration uh, the whole lower thermosphere for uh, passive and active uh, atmospheric uh, components. It has Langmuir probes, uh, mass spectrometers, other instrumentations. Uh, for 50 satellites, which spread around and should make the first satellite-based measure measurements in, in lower thermosphere, from 100 kilometers to 300 kilometers. And there is also ISI uh, project, which is a totally project. This uh, tries to develop um, economy from from uh, research ideas. And these guys are are all coming from uh, other one project and trying to build uh, a constellation to monitor the northern regions, an area which desperately needs some kind of, of data about ice movements, ice situation in real time. It's not available, and this is seriously hindering uh, the, the possibilities to, to use uh, this area, especially when the, the ice cap is melting. Uh, this, uh, these guys, the, this company just gave out of the stealth mode a uh, couple of weeks ago, or was it a month ago, so they, they had their first big article in uh, Kaupalehti, where they uh, tried to uh, attract investments and go big with this project. <coughs> they have been having negotiation, negotiations with the big player, players on the field uh, already uh, for, for a year. So in Aalto University, what we do with these nanosatellite platforms, uh, basically we, we try to use those as, as a backbone for education. Uh, so our uh, space technology students are building these small satellites. A couple of familiar faces here. And we also, also use this project as a, as a cooperation platform. We have three uh, payloads, or actually even four payloads, uh, on board of our one satellites. All these payloads are coming from a high profile uh, high-profile institutes who found a, a, a bit of money, a bit of, of, of interest to make a small instrument, a simple instrument, but with a very much new idea. 
the first and the, uh, the main instrument of ALT-1 satellite is a very small spectral imager called ARSI, which uh, was developed um, uh, with the help of uh, European Space Agency. Here you can see the, the might be easy to flight model. The model philosophy in this kind of small satellite business is not ex exactly the same as in big satellites, but it's in the calibration bench uh, here, the payload. Uh, there is also a plasma break system, which was <coughs> already presented by Pekka Janhunen here. So what we try to, to demonstrate, we try to demonstrate that this uh, system really has an effect to a small satellite orbit. So we try to reel out from the satellite 100 meters of, of very thin aluminum wire. Um, and this whole system is, is built uh, and integrated in Finnish Meteorological Institute. Uh, together with uh, s -Cube team and uh, other partners also from abroad. And there is also an um, instrument which is very small, um, very small radiation monitoring, radi radiation measurement unit uh, designed uh, by Helsinki University and University of Turku. And uh, also FMI and ASRO have been uh, involved in, in this system building. Uh, it's already also in a very final stage, and this is this is EM model here. And the first um, sort of payload is innovative, very small attitude system for a CubeSat. It has a star tracker, it has uh, uh, reaction wheels, magnet torquers, and the highly sophisticated <coughs> software. This is built in BSD Berlin Space Technology from Germany. Germany. So, what are the current topics we are working uh, in um, Department of of um, radio science and engineering are uh, because we are doing trying to do most of the of the development in house so we are working with onboard digital signal processing and data handling uh, from many aspects this computer can run linux this can uh, this is uh, more like controller based system there is fpga systems uh, for for uh, sar image processing mm, we are uh, developing small sensors. This is a solar sensor or sun sensor, which is actually coming from automotive in industry. It's quite reliable and it's very, very small. So we have developed uh, a system how to integrate this with the uh, with attitude system of, of the satellite. Of course, integration and testing, uh, communication and mission control. We have a small um, satellite <coughs> ground station on top of our building. Uh, because we are radio laboratory of, of or the radio department, we are also doing a quite a bit of uh, radio frequency and microwave <coughs> technology development. This, this is the radio for for the one satellite, and we have uh, quite a bit of equipment and laboratory for for these um, activities. ISI is developing very new and very uh, interesting concept for antenna design with a layered antenna <coughs> where, where everything is already integrated inside the antenna. If I forgot to say, then uh, ISI is developing a SAR system uh, of six satellites uh, operating at 9.4 gigahertz and expand and delivering SAR images. And we are also um, dealing with the mission design and strategy planning for these kind of space missions. For example, this is uh, from Ice Eye uh, development. They have been used significant amount of hours and days and months to find out where the money is, who needs what kind of data, and, and what kind of activities are going on in this area. So mapping very ac accurately the need of, of space technology before going to market. A new area which is coming is nanotechnology in nanosatellites, or nan satellites as, as, as all. We just finished one of the diploma theses where we mapped what kind of nanotechnology is already used in, in uh, small satellites or other satellites, and how these kind of satellites could be improved, how small you can go with a satellite, and how, um, how these nanotechnology systems are withstanding, for example, radiation, uh, vibration, other in environmental stresses uh, in, in space business. At the moment, uh, we are also working with the testing and standardization. Uh, we have built a testing center or starting to build a testing center for very small spacecraft uh, for, for ALTO. 
which hopefully will be uh, useful also for, for other companies. And um, with this kind of activity, we try to keep the, the knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, inside the house that we actually have somewhere a place where people know how to build small satellites and how to test those. Because testing is still the, the central part of the, the whole uh, space technology. And also we have one uh, PhD student who is actively participating in uh, international standardization activities. At the moment there is a lot of activities to standardize uh, nanosatellites and also the testing procedures and, and acceptance procedures for, for, uh, for nanosatellites. Uh, future. Future trends and challenges. What we can see already now is that, that launch cost will decrease further. So at the moment we're talking about 50,000 euros per kilo, maybe in a uh, good luck 25,000 euros per kilogram. But in the future this most probably will come down to 10,000 euros per, per kilogram to low, low Earth orbit. Also satellite unit cost will decrease significantly because of the standardization and partly also industrial processes which will be uh, implemented in, in satellite technology. And this also causes the satellite constellations to be much more popular. It's much more easy to actually uh, deliver the reliability of your system with many satellites which are replaceable uh, with a cloud of satellites, not only just investing to, to one um, reliability of, of one satellite. And most probably we'll see also the rapid commerci uh, commercialization because all commercial uh, companies who see that this is viable option to actually deliver something useful will come very rapidly to this area. International legislation needs uh, urgent attention. As I said already, new countries are coming to this area to play and uh, a new amount of space debris uh, will be generated to low Earth orbit. Another problem is frequency allocation. At the moment, we ITU processes for a small satellite. If you want to uh, get uh, non-amateur frequency for your satellite, the coordination takes seven years. And this is too long for a, a non-satellite project, which uh, is uh, with a span of a couple of years, maybe five years. Cooperation will increase and new players will enter to the field. And now we have a moment to think how Finland will use this opportunity of changing scene of, of, of the worldwide uh, <coughs> space technology uh, area. And we have been thinking uh, this in Aalto, have been thinking this in, in, uh, also in Aalto. One consortium with Pekka Janhunen, for example, and Pekka was one of the first who actually was, was tell us, saying loud this idea that we should have an nanosatellite program. We should have a program which plays very small payloads or very small satellites regularly to uh, uh, orbit so that we can have an access to space. If we think about the goals of this kind of program, so the most crucial part is the launch. If we can guarantee to a student <coughs> group or to a company a launch, okay, you will get the launch in one year, deliver something, they will do it. Space technology is, is uh, full of people who has a lot of enthusiasm, but it's really, really uh, difficult to access the launch. So this has been changed now forever, very rapidly, and this should be used. This most probably this window is not long, maybe five years, I don't think it might be 10 years, it's so popular to uh, make this kind of nanosatellites in, in uh, university because you just can go to the shop and buy if you need one. So in the future, most probably, you just have your payload, you order your satellite and you, it, you have it launched in, in, in half a year. This kind of, of uh, program could um, work as a platform for cooperation and it can also launch regularly small payloads, finished payloads to space which then can be uh, increased uh, gradually the, the technical readiness level for different instruments. So you start to have on your shelf different ideas, different tests, different concepts which can be elaborated for the future missions. So with this kind of program it might be possible also easier uh, to, to 
get access to the to the big bigger missions. And this kind of, of program can also guarantee the continuity in education and research in this uh, space technology area. And provide spin-off and spillover to, to Finnish economy. Okay, so nanosatellite program. Own data for high-level research, space technology education and research, uh, spin-off and spillover to economy, visibility in media, which is not a small, small part of space technology. So this visibility in media and public relations should be handled, and if we have a program, it would be much easier to, to make it in, in a coordinated way. Um, it would boost also a cooperation in Finland. If it starts with students, these students have a connections already during this uh, university time, and they go further uh, to work with industry. Uh, better uh, technical readiness level for Finnish instruments and capability to launch and operate own spacecrafts. So, thank you very much. This was my presentation. I'm open uh, to uh, an answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Jan, for a very interesting presentation. Questions or comments? Yes. I understood from your talk that this QB50 is a serious science project also, not only a, like educational technology. Definitely. Yes, yes. There are several and several projects which are approaching. The first 10 years of CubeSats has been more or less like uh, tuning your radios and doing amateur radio things and, and sort of finalizing the concept. But there is starting to be more and more scientists in every CubeSat conference. It's a science platform for, for the future as well. Is, is there anything happening with a little bit uh, more massive satellites or standardization which would put the cost down? Or is this really a step function of if you leave a CubeSat for you make a step fun function in the price? Uh, not really. Yeah, there is happening, uh, of course. And for example, there is uh, CanX standard, which is uh, in Canada. Uh, Canada, Canadians make a bit bigger CubeSat type of satellites, and there are several approaches. Also, in in, uh, uh, in I think South Korea has quite uh, a nice standard platform, and there is approaches, but none of them are so popular like CubeSat. But CubeSat leads the way; it shows the benefits. This is not the only platform. You can generate whatever platform you need, of course. What makes you believe that the uh, main reason is uh, commercial markets uh, because CubeSat has already a commercial market for, for launches. So different launch providers already now competing. And for example, uh, SpaceX has been coming into the play with their Falcon rocket rockets, which are a bit cheaper than others, and they are developing smaller uh, and, and more affordable rockets on the commercial basis, and they will come. And there is also, in military, there has been researched several projects where uh, you actually take your small rocket to the upper limit of, of atmosphere with an with a airplane, and then launch from a small rocket from there. And if you have really small, uh, small systems, you can do it. Have you considered uh, Green is coming and visit your lab after showing this uh, ice ivory in association with all those uh, oil company corporations or oil co corporations. Uh, have you recently seen uh, Greenpeace visiting uh, Fortum headquarters or Nokia? Yeah, yeah, they come from time to time, but there is a market, there is a need, there is an economy, uh, and. Uh, from this pers perspective, I would say that this ice eye type of information might be the, the, the best security insurance for this kind of activity or any kind of activity in this reg region. If we go blind to pump oil, it's much higher risk to actually get hurt. Would that answer actually mean, please, Mike? Might take it. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, just a quick uh, question. What kind of price tag would you put on the, on the national nanosatellite program? What kind of budget are we talking about? Uh, we're actually talking quite small budget. Uh, if we are thinking about one CubeSat launch, which is 50,000 euros, 
<clears throat> this is more, lo more like a, a, a proper car for a company. And Finland has and can afford one proper car for the space technology in a year. Um, in the future, uh, uh, what is your, uh, how, how do you see the uh, time of, of the projects? Uh, uh, the road going down, I, I believe our one was uh, begun in 2010, am I right? Yes. And uh, also Estonians used some five years yes. for the first one, so uh, how do you see that developing? I, ho I hope it will go down, and of course there is like it's quite complicated dynamics. But in uh, in terms of if you want to use it for education, it actually the maximum uh, mm, duration of one project should be somewhere in two years. What about uh, students? Are there now more students interested in space? Before. I think so, yes. Many are present here. Yes. So how do you see in the future the collaboration with the uh, European Space Agency? So, you know, how to yeah, NASA, NASA is operating its own CubeSat program already, and they have, in the United States, several CubeSat programs. Mm -hmm. They have DARPA program, they have military program. Um, Na uh, ESA has been already uh, launched their first CubeSat program, Launch Your Satellite. And last spring, there was a first CubeSat industry conference at ESA premises. So they are slowly heating up and, and sort of taking interest what's going on because there's like a lot of going on. If we think that there is like 1,000 and plus satellites orbiting and last year they put like 80 more, then this is a significant development. <coughs>